Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today on supporting comfort and belonging for people living with dementia. I'm Dominique Williams, the Education Manager at the Research Institute for Aging. Um, I want to welcome everybody today to what I'm sure is going to be a very engaging and informative discussion. So I have a question for our online participants today. So maybe you can just put in the chat below. First of all, do you feel that you have a good understanding of how the environment impacts persons living with dementia? And the second question I have for you is, have you found it difficult to find the necessary resources to support or improve things, um, especially in um, residential living uh, care set and care settings for persons living with dementia? So within the hour that we have today, our objective is to share resources and talk about some of the ways that thoughtful design can accomplish those improvements. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers to you. First of all, we have Agnes Houston, a well-known dementia activist who lives in Coatbridge, Scotland. Agnes was diagnosed with early onset dementia of the Alzheimer's type 15 years ago when working as a practice manager. Agnes cares for her husband, Alan, who also lives with dementia. Agnes has occupied many high level policy and advisory roles through which she has campaigned for improved dementia care. And in 2013, Agnes was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from Alzheimer's Scotland. Dr. Al Power also joins us. He is a geriatrician and Schlegel Chair in Dementia and Aging Innovation with us here at the RAA. And Laura Aguiar is a former research assistant with the RAA who worked very closely with Al to develop the resource that we're going to be discussing today. After the presentations, we're going to have about 15 minutes for your questions, so you can add your questions into the chat box or the Q&A button below. And if you have a specific question for a speaker, um, feel free to um, name them or to pose a question for the whole group. So now I'm going to hand it over to Al Power to get things started for us. Um, I am going to welcome people and start by introducing uh, my good friend, Agnes Houston. And Dominique's told you a bit about her. I first met Agnes at, uh, well, actually, I first met Agnes online. There are wonderful uh, little documentary film was made of Agnes and her friend, Nancy McAdam, describing the friendship in Scotland and some of the things that they were doing together and how they were living with a diagnosis of dementia. And then met Agnes um, at one of the uh, Alzheimer's Disease International conferences face-to-face. Uh, -face. She'll have to tell me whether it was Perth in 2015 or Budapest in uh, 2016, but we've been uh, in regular contact and we were fortunate to have Agnes to come over and speak at the RIA as part of her Churchill Fellowship. And she's going to cover uh, some of that topic right now. So welcome from Scotland, Agnes. Thank you very much, Al. Um, now, if I to talk now, am I going to, is it up, me up now? Absolutely. Okay then, right. Thank you very much, Anne, um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, put my camera on, there we are. Um, <clears throat> it's great to see you all um, and be with you in spirit virtually. My name's Agnes and um, I've been living um, with a diagnosis of early age, early stage dementia of the Alzheimer's type I was diagnosed at the age of 57, and that was 15 years ago. And when I was diagnosed, Donna, my daughter, she was told, get your mum's affairs in order. She's possibly got two years of reasonable life left. And so travel and have fun, as your mum will probably be in a nursing home within two years. Well, that prediction didn't work out, I'll tell you that, because I'm still living alone at home. So I was giving um, medication for my Alzheimer's, Ariset, um, to slow the progression down. But um, every year I saw a psychiatrist. Um, and um, when I got to the age of 65, I would put into the older age psychiatry age group, but nothing else was given for me. But my dementia slowly progressed. But as Al said, I became an active campaigner and speaker. Why did I do that? Well, it was the only way I was going to meet other people and hear people like Al and that talking and telling us how, what, the, what they were doing in the dementia world. But in this, at the conferences, and I'll know this, all I heard was talk about memory loss. 
And the people that I was talking to with dementia, they were talking about sensory loss and about their gait, their problem with their gait. But nobody was addressing this at the big conferences. And um, so at one conference, I think it was an international one, I started to complain bitterly um, about how I was having changes to my sensory, my taste and my smell, hallucinations, brain blindness, and, um, and I was getting no help. And then I think it was about eight years ago, I get bumped with a car crossing the road because my vision had got so problematic that crossing the road was just unsafe. And this bump by a car, I was at a Pelican Crossing. And um, so I asked to go and get more tests at the hospital. And I was diagnosed with neurological vision impairment due to dementia. And um, so I was still complaining. And then it was a carer who said to me, Agnes, why don't you go for a Churchill Fellowship? Travel to learn and return to inspire. So I chose to go to Canada because I knew that you were doing a lot of work and I'd heard about Schleidel villages, etc. And I wanted to go and hear what you were doing there and what your universities were doing. And it was great. I also traveled to Ireland and I had been to Australia. So I then found out a lot of the proper medical terms that I was explaining because people very kindly came up and said the proper word for being hypersensitivity to noise, et cetera, is hyperacusis. And then I said, well, what can I do about it? And they would say, well, we would do this. And that's how I got my tips and strategies. And then Hammond Care in Australia helped me turn all these um, traveling um, information into the book that you can download free called Talking Sense, Living with Sensory Changes and Dementia. So that was a big plus. Now people living with dementia in Scotland and indeed all over the world could use this book and say, I've got that, can I have this? And it changed the dialogue in Scotland in the United Kingdom on dementia. And they started to talk about sensory changes, you know. But the summer of this year, my balance started to be really problematic. And um, so I was walking with a walker and I asked to see a gait specialist because I had heard people from Australia talking about this. And um, the gait specialist that I went to see, see said, I walked in like a toddler who was just learning to walk, holding on to walls for support, wobbling everywhere. And on examination, my muscle strength was like a teenager's because I do yoga and exercises and I've got strong muscles. He said, you know, this isn't a problem for us. You need to see a neurologist. And it could take two to three years in Scotland to see one. Well, I wasn't prepared to wait all that length of time. So I went online. I'd heard about this associate professor, James McLaughlin, a neurophysiotherapist who was doing work with dementia and gait and walking. And for two years, I've been following him and doing his exercises, etc. And um, I'm now walking without a walker. And I'm very, very pleased about that. So it's, it's not easy. So I'm not saying everybody can do this. It's not easy. It's not for the faint hearted, but with guidance, with a known scribe of villages and that, that they have kinesiologists and things and people like that. With giving gentle exercises, keeping them simple, keeping them fun, but do it regular, make it a habit forming. You can rewire and retrain your brain and we can live a life full of joy and laughter. Yes, my life has changed, but change sometimes for the better, 
you know. My Churchill Fellow, has, they have offered me another grant because they love what I've done to create an online course based on the talking sense and on my findings. So with the assistance of Hammond Care, this is going to be developed. So maybe I'll come and present it in two years time, who knows, um, or online to your, um, your event. Um, but it's an online course to enable audiologists, ophthalmologists, and gait specialists, um, neurological um, physiotherapists to help us with our dementia so we can get the best practice from them. You know, I often feel that uh, my belief is that dementia is a neurological condition of the brain with physical symptoms and social issues. So we need to think outside the box. Memory is only one of the physical symptoms that is being displayed. There are many others. So could we put it in context, please? Um, I talk about now, think dementia, think sensory, and then think environment and design, because you can use design to enable us to live well, either in the community or in the care home or in your own home, making it an enabling place rather than a disabling place. You know, so that's all I'm going to say um, with that. Um, thank you for listening to me. I can chat and answer any of your questions or indeed email me if you've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes, for, um, well, first of all, I hope we do see you in two years presenting on your um, e-learning course. That would be amazing. But thank you so much for not only sharing your own story with us, um, it was very impactful, but for also changing the conversation around the symptoms of dementia. And as you said, not just focusing on memory, but on all those other physical symptoms that um, include sensory changes. So now I'm going to pass it over to um, Al and to Laura, and they're going to give us their presentation on the resource that was recently developed. Thanks so much, Dominic, and thanks so much, uh, Agnes, for kicking this off. Agnes's book is really wonderful. I have learned a lot from it. And as a doctor who's taken care of people with dementia for many years, there, there was information in there that was, that was helpful for me, too, that I had not completely understood. So there's nothing like the person who experiences something being the one to help teach us about what that experience is like. Um, the uh, link to a free download of Agnes's book is in the chat box. So please click on that and get it bookmarked on your, uh, on your browser so that you can uh, get it. And thanks, Agnes, also for the segue to the next section, which is talking about a design resource that we have for you. And um, what I'm going to do uh, is share some slides. And there we go. I hope everybody can see that. Let me know if you can. If the pictures get in the way, just go down to a single speaker view or, or no speaker view, and then we won't be covering up any of the words on the slide. Um, I'm going to start by talking a bit about where the guide came from, why we did this. And then Laura uh, Aguiar, who developed the guide with me, will be talking a bit, walking you through it to show you in detail what it looks like. And we have sent out uh, copies of this ahead to uh, participants. Hopefully you've had a time to look at it so that you have some questions, but um, but uh, we're happy to share that with you. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end before our questions about uh, what we've done to evaluate the guide and where we're going from here. So um, when I joined uh, the Research Institute as a, as a regular chair a few years ago, one of the charges that the Schlegel family gave me to think about working on in my work at the RIA was uh, something around the idea of design and dementia. And I have to admit, initially I was a little bit um, unsure because there are a lot of resources out there on dementia related design, architectural design, et cetera. And so I wanted to find something that was different, that would offer something that you couldn't get anywhere else. Um, it just so happens I've also been speaking for a long time about the concept of not separating people with dementia from people without dementia integrating and creating inclusive environments in residential care in, uh, and in retirement. And I'm working on a book about that with um, my friend, uh, Dr. Jennifer Carson from University of Nevada at Reno. And um, one of the things uh, that I talked about when I wrote a blog about this several years ago was that part of the problem, I think that people are afraid to unlock doors 
is that they just assume that when the door is unlocked, people are going to run for the exits and it will be a very dangerous situation. In fact, uh, without going into detail, the research shows just the opposite. A lot of people just need to know that they can exit, but it doesn't mean that they have to. But really, uh, I understood that if we were going to create inclusive communities and, and help address this worry, we needed to create an environment where people weren't going to go running for the exits if the door was unlocked. And I believe that there are basically three reasons why a person will try to leave a living area. And none of them has anything to do specifically with dementia. Um, there are, because they're the same reasons any of us would. Uh, the first reason, and the one we can never forget, is that walking is a normal human activity. Being curious, exploring, stretching our legs, getting out and, and moving around. The only thing that's really abnormal is actually putting people in the living environment where they're locked in and can't walk. That's the abnormal part. Uh, so we have to understand that we need to accommodate everybody's need to move uh, wherever they live. The other two reasons people leave, uh, I think, uh, once again, to be very simplistic, they're related to each other. One is that people may be looking for something that is not available to them there. And number two, they may be trying to get away from something that is there. And uh, once again, that's simplistic. It's not always a thing. It could be a quality. It could be an aspect of well-being, which is not being met. And um, so I thought what would help people to do what Jennifer and I are talking about, if we could come up with a guide to help people evaluate the living environment where they live and work, to help find the things that make it an uncomfortable place for people to be so that they might feel like they don't want to be there. And once again, that's not to mention, none of us wants to be in a place where our needs are not being met. And it happened that I was able to work with Laura in a practicum project. And um, Laura has just added so much to this, including a personal experience of living on a memory care area for 24 hours as a resident and really observing what that was like. And I'm sure she'll mention that. And, and Laura, I, I have to give Laura credit for, for this guide and what it looks like. It would have been just very boring content if I'd done this alone, but she took the content we developed and uh, she was able to make it very engaging and very interactive. Um, we did a lot of research, a lot of reading. We got input from academics, from architecture practitioners, and also from people like Agnes and other people living with dementia who gave us advice on the guide. And then uh, the guide was released. And then uh, last time I was in Canada before I was banned south of the border for the pandemic in March of 2020, we did a guide evaluation. I'll just mention a couple of notable features that may separate it a bit from other environmental design guides that you see. First of all, this is not really designed specifically for architects or high level planners. It's really designed to be used by the team members who work in an, in an area and the residents there as they are able. Uh, it could be can be used in retirement communities, it can be used in long-term care, and it can be used in either dementia-specific or integrated living areas because the qualities are the same. It tends to incorporate areas that are not seen in some other guides. So we have learned a lot from Agnes and, and we have shared her resource. And some of, the, uh, some of the things I've learned as a geriatrician about changes with aging, but also some of the things that Agnes has taught us about sensory changes that can occur uh, living with dementia. We have sections about how the environment may meet or not meet people's needs or support or not support different aspects of well-being. And we brought in things like operational and interpersonal aspects. So how are the team members using the space? How are people relating to each other? And does the environment, is it conducive to that? Or is it not conducive to that? And we tried to employ what I consider cutting edge concepts regarding dementia and culture change. And really understanding dementia from the point of view of the experience of the person. And so you're not going to, for example, see advice in our guide that you should put a mural that looks like a bookshelf on a door to keep people from exiting. Because what does a two-dimensional bookshelf do besides confuse people and, um, and, and not really solve the need that is taking them to the door in the first place? Um, it can be used to evaluate the living space in general. It can also be used uh, to look at an individual person. Laura will talk a bit more about that. And it's made uh, so it can be subdivided so that individual discussion topics can be held. And every um, guide has also action planning sessions so the team can take their thoughts, write them down, and then come up with a plan to move forward. So with that, I am going to um, move to Laura and have her uh, take over at this point and take you through the guide in a bit more detail. Just let me know when it's my turn. <laughs> You're on, Laura. Okay, can everyone see me okay? Al's gonna do my slides. Um, so again, my name is Laura Aguiar. I did a practicum placement 
in the last year of my undergrad, which actually inspired me completing my master's degree in public health. And that's because this topic really inspired me to really think about population health. It's, and this project inspired population health on a level of people living with specifically with dementia. But in general, this lens of how to help a group of people um, in a way that is impactful for them. So to start off, we'll talk about the themes that Al and I decided to include and cover in this tool. And the components of a traditional assessment and adult tool are included, as well as aspects that appreciate that a retirement home or long-term care setting or congregate living um, are where people live and where we want people to thrive. And because those are the goals, those are the goals of our tool. And for this reason, we created the tool with the humanity of a person in mind. I really was like inspired by when Agnes just shared that you can have an environment that enables living rather than disabling a person. And I think that's what we've tried to do here. And so many aspects of the built environment can have a positive or negative impact on the people who live there. And the following components that are on this slide are areas of the physical environment that are included in our tool. And we included certain physical environments because we think they're important to consider. Um, so that's acoustic, lighting and deck, um, flooring and decor and wayfinding. Those are the main physical parts. The other components that we included, which to, for Al and I, we think aren't typically covered in an audit tool, which are addressing unmet needs. And addressing unmet needs is an important theme we cover in the tool because residents may be searching for something outside their living space, which Al had mentioned before somebody just wanting to go on a walk um, because, that's a because they are available to them or maybe something's not actually meeting their needs and so they're searching for that. And so we discuss aspects of a person's life where they may need additional support, like movement and exercise, meaningful activities, um, connections, caregiving opportunities, perhaps that they had in their life before they arrived to where they're living right now. And the third theme that we discussed is interpersonal and operational factors. And this is an important theme because of the traditional setting that we often see with individuals living with dementia. And so sometimes the interpersonal and operational factors can cause distress or attempts for someone to go elsewhere. And so these factors can enhance or diminish a domain of someone's well-being. And Al has talked long, and there, it, these aspects of well-being are in his books, which is talking about a person's identity, their connectedness, the sense of security or autonomy. And so our tool kind of helps someone to pick apart those aspects of an environment or design and really analyze that and see if someone's um, needs are being met there. So next I'll talk about the layout of the tool, just the next slide out, perfect. So I wasn't, the tool is, is has lots of pages but there is a theme throughout the pages and they all look a little similar. And that's just so that the tool can be used individually, one section at a time, depending on how someone wants to implement this in an environment or design space. So each of the themes I discussed are covered in a similar way and in a similar layout, which we hope to share information in a way that's content rich, applicable to everyday settings, but also helpful and encourages a sense of reflection as well as customization for a specific space. And so we do this by having a small information section, which is under each heading, um, a pause and reflect question, which is just to stimulate thoughtful discussion as well as a formal exercise. So there's a place to you know, ask yourself some questions, but then also a space for you to write down answers to some of the questions we encourage you to ask. The last spot, which I think on each section is really important and that I would need is whenever I use something, I wanna know, okay, how can I apply this or what would be helpful? So we have a tip section that gives you ideas of a way that you could change something in the environment under that topic. So the one that I shared right now is the flooring and decor, just a snapshot of what that looks like. And so an easy win that we suggest in the tip section would be uh, having a distinctive color for the washroom door to help somebody understand um, or have identified vacation marker of a washroom door in a public space. So next slide, Al. Perfect. So just going to do a quick sound exercise, and it may be effective in the place that you're in right now, and it may not. So I just want everybody to take a moment to close your eyes and listen to the sounds in the physical space that you're in right now. And just really think about, do you hear any unnatural sounds that could confuse a resident or someone living with dementia. Now just count to 10, it'll seem wrong.
So if you did hear something, maybe share it in the chat, let us know. But maybe if you didn't, and that might be because you chose a quiet space to listen to our webinar. Um, but if you didn't hear anything, maybe when you're in a healthcare setting, if that's the type of job you have or a congregate care setting, you know, try to pause today for 10 or 15 seconds and just think about the perspective from somebody else, perhaps exactly what Agnes is talking about, the sensory perspective, you know, what someone else could hear. I've seen people saying, hearing the furnace, someone's husband's talking, you know, it, those things do, do have an effect on how we live our daily life. And that could be a reason somebody may or may not have a sense of comfort and belonging in, in the space that they're in. So next slide, Al. Perfect. So Al touched on this, and I think the action plan part for us, we put this at the end of the tool. And that's because I, as Al had mentioned, at a part of my practicum placement, he had encouraged me, and so I kind of got the, the confidence to, to stay at one of the Schlegel Village's um, dementia in this section where people living with dementia were living. And I didn't pretend that I was an, aud an auditing person. I just simply lived and engaged with people living with dementia um, and stayed in a room overnight. I was there for 24 hours. And so this really gave me an insight into a little bit of maybe what it could be like living with dementia because I don't have that experience, but a little bit of insight into how people were reacting, but as well as an understanding and compassionate frame of mind to know as a staff member working there, you know, what tasks need to be done and it's very busy. And so that really inspired the action plan, which is a section created to inspire and foster resident focused change while harnessing that people have passion and energy about wanting to change it and acknowledging that Sometimes it can be difficult to be in a space and that that's where you work, but it's also where people live. And so we created the action plan to try to give step-by-step -step ways that somebody could, for example, approach their management or approach a staff member, or just to give a tool to start this conversation about ways that we could change something in the design to help um, focus on residents living with dementia and their experience. And so finally, I'll just talk my last slide. Perfect, is the appendices. And so, like I just said, you know, gaining perspective can be difficult sometimes if you're not immersing yourself like I did, or if you don't have readily access to um, somebody living with dementia. We hope that you do, and our goal is that you would always speak to someone living with dementia. As you can tell, Agnes has, is the best person to speak about her experiences. And so, so we wanted to give Foster an idea of where you could be reflective about what it would be like, for example, or what the statements would be for someone experiencing dementia in a different frame of mind. So we have two appendices, three appendices in the tool. And so um, the blue image on the left is appendix A, and it's an adaptation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs with statements that an individual living with dementia may share if they're experiencing different aspects of engagement with their environment. The other one on the right, is the green one and it's appendix C. And it uses examples to illustrate how a resident might experience different domains of well being. And these are the domains of well being that are, are adapted from Al's book, um, Dementia Beyond Disease Enhancing Well Being. And so it's just this idea to give a, a tool that encourages reflection and statements that just might inspire this perspective where we're really trying to encourage um, people to have a book design and, and people living with dementia. Great, thanks so much, Laura. And um, I'll just go on and share a few comments from the evaluation just so you can see how this worked with the team. Although because Laura mentioned this, um, I'm working at Aaron Mills Lodge today in Mississauga, Ontario. And this is something that they're using. If you can see it um, in my camera view, um, you know, a lot of times people with dementia, when they see a silhouette of a man or a woman on the door, that doesn't mean what we think it should mean. And so using the word and an actual picture of what the person's looking for, namely a toilet, is a much more engaging way. And we found people are much more successful at using the washroom when we put something there that was understandable to them. So that's just one, one uh, picture of something that, that Laura was talking about. Um, we did an evaluation in March of 2020, as I mentioned. We went to one dementia-specific long-term care neighborhood at Schlegel Village's um, Village at University Gates. And uh, we spent about a total of three hours during the week of engagement with various team members and at various times of day. So we were there on the day shift and the evening shift and trying to capture different moments when, when, when the ebb and flow of activity might be different. 
And what we found was we did we did recordings and transcripts of all these walk arounds. And and even with that bit of engagement with the guide being used as a prompt for those team members to actually think about the space they were in, there were a total of 53 recommendations made from just that evaluation. And I think the most uh, important thing is that most of it was not tear down the walls or, or build a new building. There were only six of those 53 recommendations would be considered high cost or high impact renovations. Half of them were low cost, low impact, something as simple as uh, you know, putting a dimmer switch on a bedroom light so that fluorescent light isn't isn't uh, shining in someone's eyes or doesn't bother the person next door if it's a double room or rearranging chairs so people can engage more easily than they might have been the way the chairs were set up. And um, there were several that were also sort of medium cost, medium impact. In that case, maybe running the uh, room wiring, bedroom wiring to a table lamp instead of an overhead fluorescent light. So when you turn the light switch on, you're not um, bl blinding somebody with that bright overhead ceiling light. Um, the guy was felt by, by the team that uh, used it to be accessible and understandable, and they found it highly useful. And they met, many of them discovered factors that even though they'd worked there for years had not noticed until they were prompted to look at things through the eyes, ears, senses of a person living there. And it also provided documentation of issues that had been noted but were not addressed. And sometimes there's frustration. We've been talking about this for three years and nothing's been done about it. So this gives people a document to show uh, what their concerns are. And as Laura said, the action planning guide is specifically directed to help them contact the right people to help them. It was felt to be a great way to empower those direct support workers and tap into their knowledge and expertise based on their daily work and their daily interactions with the residents. And um, one of the recommendations was because it is a very comprehensive guide to break out the sections. They could be laminated, they could be broken up into flashcards and that each, uh, uh, each topic or, or sections of each topic, like the tip section or a pause and reflect question could be a huddle topic. And for the organizations who are doing that important uh, job of doing daily huddles, this can be extremely useful. I just wanted to use a few, a few slides. Oh yeah, here's an example. This is the lighting section. So these were, there were eight low cost or seven low cost, low effort suggestions for lighting. One was a dimmer for various lights to adjust levels so they're not always up or down. One was to use table lamps in common areas so the overhead fluorescent lights could be turned down or off. One was using lighting in quiet areas like the country kitchen or parlor to encourage visitation uh, in a better way than they were. One was to enhance the washroom contrast, as we mentioned. Not only the door, but colored toilet seats so people with all the white fixtures can actually see where they're supposed to sit and not have accidents as a result. Individualizing lighting to each person's preference. And once again, this is not so much about the electricity as it is really asking each person, do you like to sleep in a quiet room, a dark room? Do you like a night light? Uh, you know, when, if, you, if I come in to help you at night, do you want me to turn the light on? Do you want me to come in in the dark with just my cell phone glowing? How would you prefer to be, you know, to be helped in the middle of the night? Keeping common room lighting low at night so that um, it doesn't look like, you know, bright of day all day and all night, which can be confusing. And there were some rooms which uh, had lights that were either on or off. And when they were left on, they often would draw people in um, who might then get confused or, or stuck in a room. So using sensors, motion sensors, is a great way to only have the rooms lit up when they are being used uh, for a purpose. And uh, there are me the medium ones for that. Once again, connecting the bedroom light switch to a table lamp, finding curtains that were solid in the double rooms. Uh, we'd like, of course, with the pandemic to get rid of double rooms. But while you have them, we noticed that all the curtains had um, translucent or transparent or open parts at the top. And that's where the light was leaking into the neighbor's uh, room at night. And actually making them solid on top would make more sense installing softer incandescent lighting in tub rooms than the fluorescence they had. And then the high cost would be to redo the lighting to really get rid of overhead fluorescence, which are so harsh for many people and can compound sensory changes uh, with aging and dementia. So here's some representative comments just to show you the kinds of things. And these were each of these slides is a conversation where I copied what people were saying to each other as we walked around. So during the eyes closed listening exercise, and Laura and I would do this for a full minute and do it in a common area like the living room and have people listen. And there were a lot of insights. Uh, here's a conversation, the TV, I heard the TV, something distressful is going on. The next person says, yeah, somebody was yelling, what the hell are you doing? 
yeah, that distracted me a lot. And then the banging in the kitchen, that was in the kitchen next door, the dining room. And someone else said, part of it's the sensitivity to the fact that they're making a noise because some of them are just trying to get done quickly. So once again, are we focusing on the task and not thinking about the sound we're creating when we're putting dishes into a dishwasher and whether that can be bothersome to people around us? Uh, we got to an end of a hallway that was sort of a dead end with a window and some doors that people couldn't get into. So you're down by three locked doors. You don't know where to go. You can see why people get stuck. They have this door, they have that door, they have this thing, it's a storage, and one interjects and they're all locked. And the flooring has changed. It kind of feels live here, echoey sound-wise. Imagine being here, being stuck here, and then looking down there and having no idea where your room is because they're searching maybe for a rest, looking for a bathroom and thinking this must be one, these doors. And then there was one place down at the end where there were miscues. So here we are walking straight toward this wide open space and there's a big field coming in through the window and lots of sunshine, and then you smell it. It's amazing how many men will just gravitate to this space because it's a field, it's open. The flooring, there's a drain. It just seems, looks like a place where some of them might urinate if they have to go and they can't find the toilet. And design flaws. So they found that the, the handrail was just at the height so people in wheelchairs were getting their wheels stuck under the railing. So they couldn't wheel down the side of the hall without getting caught and being stuck. So once again, going back to the architects or interior designers and saying, the railing has to be either higher or lower. It can't be at the exact height where wheels can get stuck underneath it. Um, here's another operational factor. Residents can sense there's something happening if the team gets loud as they're giving a report, you know, and seeing people come and go with bags and purses and coats, right? They're supposed to keep things downstairs, but if they don't, it's like, oh, they're packing up at the end of the day. I should pack up at the end of my day too. So what are the cues we give with our operations to people who may be confused? And the idea of using the guide at different times. We had a resident that used to live in Hague who got shot down in the war around Christmas time and detained for two months. We didn't know this history about it. We decorated for Christmas, we had Christmas music playing. He picked up one of those tables and threw it when I was working on evening shift. And once we found out that he was detained around Christmas, we took the decorations down, we stopped playing the music and he had no further physical expressions because he was scared, you know? So I think if we did the scan then when he was here and saw those stimuli that this was too much for him and made it normal for him, it would have been okay. And here's one comparing to other ministry assessments and really showing the advantages of this. I think it's nice. Like when we do our pieces assessment and we look at individual things, we look at social and environmental. But if we can embed this into, use this framework, what we found, it would be very useful because the other assessments are not specific enough. So people often with some of the things like pieces and layered nature framework, they say that, that their eyes kind of glaze over. They're not quite sure what to do with those categories in the real world. And this really brought people down to a very granular, practical level so that um, they could see exactly what actionable uh, responses might be. So I'm going to stop sharing there. And um, we still have about 20 minutes left in the hour. And I want to thank you all. Maybe we can bring up uh, Agnes and, and Laura uh, and Dominique. And um, we can just have a question and answer. And um, there's a chat box or a Q&A box. I'm sorry. I see there's a few in there already. Go ahead and use the Q&A box and uh, type any questions you have. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. So thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Al. Um, yeah, it's just wonderful to see how the resource um, is so practical. And as you said, there are, you can use it and come up with really concrete steps and they don't have to be huge or expensive that these small things that you can change can have such an impact um, for, for all residents, not just residents living with dementia. So just a reminder, um, Hillary has put in the chat um, the links to Al's, Al and Laura's um, resource, the Supporting Comfort and Belonging for People Living with Dementia. So you can access it there. It was emailed out already. Um, and also she put in a link to um, the resource from Agnes as well, the Talking Sense, which is also an excellent, excellent resource. Um, we weren't going to share the slides, but Hillary has indicated that the webinar is going to be recorded. So you'll be able to access the slides that way if you want to go back and have a read of anything. Um, I see in the Q&A, we've got about 15 uh, to 25 um, minutes. Um, so I'm going to go to the Q&A and um, read out a couple of the questions that we have coming in here. Um, Leanne says, our home staff often turn off the lights in hallways and common rooms in the afternoon and right after supper to encourage residents to be calm and nap and go to bed. I've heard this can increase, confu increase confusion. What are your thoughts? 
If I can jump in on that, I think that there's there are a few things going on there. And once again, I think it is more than just maybe lights up or lights down. Maybe the lights are being used because of other things. And one of the nice things about this guide is it will help you unpack some of the other factors. You are enabling two times a day when there's a lot of commotion. The afternoon is change of shift. It's report time when you don't see as many faces around as people coming and going with their jackets. Um, and you're also talking about after meals when there's cleanup and the people have finished, maybe need a washroom, are looking for what is going to happen next. So the lighting may help uh, induce some calm, particularly if the lighting is somewhat harsh in the first place, but it might also be covering up the fact that people have other needs or that there are other things in the environment, the noise, the commotion, et cetera, that are actually causing that, uh, that distress. And maybe uh, rather than the lights, what we need to do is to take this guide and go through some of those other factors and make sure everything in that time of day is being properly addressed. And then remember lighting is more than just uh, strong or dim lighting. It is the type of lighting. Is it is it ambient lighting versus uh, you know direct glaring bulbs? Is it causing glare on surfaces like tables or floors? Um, and 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 look at the quality of the light as well as the quantity. And I think that those are all some things you that would help get you started. Anybody else have anything they want to say about that, Agnes or Laura? Yes, please. And um, you know. Uh, it almost felt as if they were using the lighting to control a situation rather than being personal. And, you know, maybe it would take maybe one or two members of staff to just sit in the environment to see how would they feel if the light went off, you know, um, you know, um, and you've not got control over it you know, and then you can't see. Because with the aging eye, um, what you don't want is to be in a dimmed area because you need a brighter light to see, you know, and a lot of residents have the aging um, conditions of the eye. So yes, I love the guide. And I think I would say, refer to the guide that you have written and use it and see if you can't come up. Be a detective and find your own answers and your own solutions as to um, how you can make it better for the people that you're supporting. Great answer. Thanks, Agnes. Yeah. Uh, Atul says, um, she, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if it's he or she, would love to know thoughts on the impact of dual sensory loss because some of the strategies that might be best suited for individuals with single sensory loss, like hearing loss or vision loss, might not be useful for those with dual sensory loss because the compensation of using the other intact hearing or vision sense may not be uh, helpful in the best possible way. Any thoughts on dual sensory loss and how we can address that? Well, you know, I, I feel coming in there that I speak to people living with dual sensory loss. Um, and when I speak to them, you know, what is it they said? You know, one person with a condition, you only know that one person with, a de, de, uh, that, with the condition. And it depends on whether they've been born with it or whether it acquired towards the end of their life, you know? So again, it's personal to the person. And I think it's sitting down and um, communicating and asking the appropriate questions, getting a history, talking to family members, and then find, finding out what works for that person. And then assisting the staff to communicate appropriately you know, with the person who has the dual sensory loss. Um, because start, I was intimidated um, when I was in speaking to people um, with the dual sensory because I've never said, I've never experienced that. And I didn't want to hurt their feelings or use inappropriate language and inappropriate touching you know, and uh, do you come from the side? Do you come from the front? So it is personal to the person. And again, it's learning and do not be afraid to ask. Do not be afraid to ask. And if you don't know, then go to your team leader or whoever or and say, can you get us the correct information? We need training on this. 
Yeah, yeah and I think I definitely want to encourage just the tool is is set up that you can they're open ended questions. So you can ask yourself them as, per, as it pertains to an individual person, as well as how it pertains to a set of congregate, like in a congregate living setting where a group of people are, are living. So it's flexible in that way that it's thoughtful questions and important perspectives that you can apply to one person's experience or a group of people. So just keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about how to apply it in, in the settings that you're in. Yeah, that's a great point, Laura, because some of our um, participants today may be actually living in, still in the community with persons living with dementia. And can they apply some of these strategies within their own home? You had a just had us just sitting and listening to our our own environments and a lot of us are working from home and I was surprised at how many things I could hear even with my headset on so you would say that 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 your tool is also for persons still living in the community. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, and I'll concede this, it definitely, we we recognized what the ask was, with which was more of the clinical setting, which Al has perspective in, and then we researched. But I mean, it's applicable because we're asking you to think about it from the perspective of, for example, Agnes. We're asking you to think about her experience. And so by having that approach, it can be used in that way. And I know Al is going to make a point. Yeah, no, yeah, and, and we, we we did design this really for congregate care environments, and and as Laura says, there are places where it's perfectly applicable, like when you talk about lighting or glare or things like that. There are other areas where you talk about interactions with other residents, for instance, where it might not be applicable. Um, we have been in some discussions about possibly uh, doing another version of the guide that is more specifically for family members and home care uh, staff to use in the home environment that really speaks to the language and the specifics of living in a private home or a Department. That hasn't happened yet. I think there's a lot in here you can use, but uh, maybe down the road we'll have something that's actually specifically designed for those people. Fantastic. So Ed asks, um, for anyone that would like to answer this one, in your research, have you seen anything um, about designing for outdoor parks or outdoor spaces? Yeah, you know, Laura and I looked at a lot of um, existing guides out there. We decided we were going to, we were just going to have people audit the living area. We were not going to get into the outdoor spaces uh, other than having access to the outdoors. We did talk in our evaluation about the outdoor courtyard next to this neighborhood and the problems they have with, with letting people go out there because the line of sights or, or the concerns about where the exit was or how, how the team members could get there if they needed to help somebody. So there were some design aspects that were addressed. But as far as actually how to design the outdoor area, there are a couple of guides out there. Um, the ones I would I would point you to that I'm aware of are the work of um, the work of uh, the Dementia Enabling uh, Environments Project in Australia, the DEEP project, and the work of uh, RID professors Richard Fleming and Kirsty Bennett, who've done a lot of work with Dementia Australia. And then also uh, up, where, up where Agnes is, the University of Stirling has some wonderful online design guides and actually an interactive app you can use in the uh, on your phone. And they have sections on whether uh, both indoor and outdoor environments are dementia enabling or not. And so I would I would definitely start with those. Mm. Great. Can I come in there? And sure, go ahead, Agnes. The, the, you can download, if you go on, the deep guide which is for indoor and outdoor spaces. And it was written by people living with dementia. And you, it's just a, an A4 type page. And you just use it to walk around your outdoor space. And it gives you tips and hints of what to look for so that you're actually doing that wee audit yourself. So it's very accessible, you know. Um, and so, yeah. Now I'll just mention quickly that Agnes actually has done a service in Scotland where she will go in and survey some long-term care homes. So instead of having the ministry yeah. come in, Agnes goes in as a person with dementia and tells you what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like to her so that you get the perspective of somebody who's actually experiencing those brain changes, which is wonderful. Yeah. So important, yes. Thanks for sharing those resources, wonderful. Um, for all of you, what do you see in new senior living um, or long-term care or retirement homes coming in new designs? I'd love to kick this to Laura first because she spent a day and the night living in one. And so after your experience, Laura, what do you want to see <laughs> that you didn't? Um, I think the current, the design that I was living in, which is a relatively new Schlegel Villages, the design was okay, it was fine. 
but it did feel like a hotel. Yeah. That's a genuine, I don't know, there, there will be lots of research and there will be lots of clinicians that will be able to describe what we should have, what we can't have, but that feeling of home, I think we still have work to do to achieve that feeling of home. This is my space, that I'm comfortable here. And I think that will take a little bit for, for experts to get together and learn that, but I think the key to finding out where that sense of home is is with speaking with people who are living in that place and asking what what is home to them and then being flexible as a space constantly for the people that live there and having that flexibility will encourage you know a welcoming sense and I think will resonate with people even if they don't have the words to explain things to you I mean I stayed there for 24 hours and I made friends who I couldn't communicate yeah. with words but I, there was a person that I, when I was living there, and she would hold, we would hold hands on the couch. And it just happened so organically. And it was a beautiful experience that I had because I was just sitting alone on the couch and she came and held my hand and we didn't need to communicate. I knew she was my friend for the next 24 hours. I could go to her and she was going to hold my hand. And so I think that speaks to the, the setting and how much people have to contribute to their own places that they're living in. That's great, thanks. And I know that one of the one of the advantages of the guy that does point to the things that aren't physical too. So one thing I would want, besides like private rooms for everybody, one thing I would want in every senior living uh, place is uh, not something you see in the building, and that is consistent, dedicated uh, staffing. So that the same people are taking my clothes off every day. I don't have a parade of strangers coming in my room. So that's not something you're going to see in most design guides. But this will talk, will speak to that, and will remind you that there's more than just the building that makes it the ideal place for people to feel comfortable and live. Agnes, is there anything that you would like to add about what you would like to see to- Do you know, yeah, I think, you know, I can put up with anything, but people make it home. It's the staff that make it feel welcoming it's the cheerful fight smiles and I know when I visited a few of your um, villages and that it was the staff that was consistent and you seen residents and, and the people living there going up and it was a welcome it was the acknowledgement I know you you know me you know that I loved um there you know um so yes Environment is very, very good, but you can have the perfect environment and not have the staff that goes with it and you will sit uncomfortable, you know. So um, it's, a, it's you've got to get, it's a, a, what is it, together, you've got, it's like making a cake. You need all the ingredients to make it rise and taste nice. So, um, you know, so keep that in mind that be kind to your staff because they're one of the most important ingredients of anything. Yes, you're right. It's If it's about making it feel like a home, it's not just the environment. You're right. It's, yeah. the, it's the actual feeling inside the environment. So we just have a couple of minutes left. So maybe time for one more quick question. And maybe I'll put this one to Laura. Um, you, you touched on it just briefly. Um, you were saying that if teams are working through the guide and they would like to know sort of where to start, and especially if leadership, um, you know, hasn't been notified or isn't on board, how do they start a conversation with leadership around, you know, looking or doing that environmental scan and starting to, um, you know, try and um, see things through the eyes of someone living with dementia in that setting? Yeah, so the guide has lots of components. I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed by that. Look at them as individual topics and each individual topic can be explored. It just takes a couple questions to spark some inspiration about where you could make some change. So I encourage you to take whatever you think would be easier or where you see maybe, oh, I think for example, that overhead lighting is kind of maybe it's frustrating people or you see people living with it's shiny people are avoiding that space you know use one of the topics that maybe is an easy get um, and then use the action plan to help yourself facilitate a conversation we created it so that you could somebody could go to management or even a peer and just say you know I filled out this action plan or it inspired me to come up with these ideas I think that maybe we have some spaces that we could make improvements on or even just for example like Al said 
not wear our coats and have our backpack when we leave. Maybe we could just change that. And so I think that's where, you, where people can start. Start with an easy win and use the action plan to help facilitate a, a positive conversation because this is important change that is culture change, which is the goal of what we're talking about today. Dominique, do I have a minute to make one other comment? You have we... a minute to make one other comment. Go for yes. it now. Just because I saw a question come up that I think is a very uh, common one, and it's an important point I want to make, because we opened a couple of greenhouse homes in Rochester where I worked, and we had a very large long-term care home with over 400 people living in three connected buildings. And there's concern there about a small household of 10 people, how you can personalize it, how you can meet the needs of a different group of people. And that's a common question and concern. And so I want to show you that the reality is actually kind of the opposite of that. And that is when you have 10 people, it's much more easy to individualize than when you have 20 or 30 or 400. And when we were first building these, a lot of people didn't want to go or their family members were concerned and said, well, we have concerts here. You know, we have big bingo games. We have all these things going on. Won't people be bored there? Um, but what you you find out is you do less of the artificial entertainment and you do more of the relational household maintaining maintaining type of thing and you still have concerts and things too but it's much more rich because you're with people you know really well and i remember we had a we had a veterans day ice cream social in the large home and i remember our ceo they had chocolate vanilla and strawberry ice cream and he said when we open our greenhouses if you want butter pecan you can have that if you want rocky road you can have that right now we got 100 people here we can only give you three flavors but when you move to a small household, we can customize everything you want for you. So I think that um, just to sort of go go in a little different direction, I think the small households are the answer for a lot of things, um, not just good care of people with dementia, but also uh, with COVID and everything else is proof that these are safer places to live. Yeah, great point. Thanks so much. Well, thank you again for that absolutely uh, amazing and informative presentation and Agnes for all of your thoughts and your sharing your story with us. I'm going to hand it back to Sherry now to close up the webinar for us. Thanks, Dominique. Boy, that was a, an amazing presentation. I just want to really say a huge thank you to Laura, Allen, Agnes, um, your expertise and thoughts on on the importance of how we look at our environment is such a uh, important piece for us to be constantly um, watching and and be alert to and I, I really appreciate that and I, I love the idea of the cutting edge I, I wanted to note Agnes's comment in the chat about noise pads on the chair legs I thought that was you know how important that is that that awful squeak when someone moves their chairs must be terrible for some people you know so I, I really appreciate all of your thoughts um, uh, we will be sending out an evaluation after this to just ask what you guys thought about the session and hear, so that we can hear uh, from you and how we can improve or um, what other ideas you have for sessions we could do in the future. And I know Dominique mentioned the recording will be shared next week. So there uh, we are doing the recording so that you can um, refresh your memory on the things that um, you heard uh, today and saw on the, uh, on the PowerPoint. And I just want to say a huge thanks to Hillary and the team at RIA. The partnership that Capital Care and RIA have developed over the years has really become a great community of sharing of expertise and um, and excellent professionalism. And we really encourage you to to join us in that with by joining us at the conference in May 22. Um, and if you want to. Um, be notified about that conference, just go onto the RIA website and you can you can uh, sign up for some of those updates that on the conference that's coming up. Um, we do want to also remind you that if you have a session idea, you have till the 30th to um, submit that and that information is on the website as well. So really mark your calendars for May 26th, 27th, uh, 2022. And thank you to all our panelists, just an amazing um, webinar in an hour, we've jam packed it. So thanks everyone for being here and joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much everyone. Thanks to Agnes and Laura. Thank you. Bye, everybody.